Hi, I'm Philip Stark. Thank you for coming to this virtual talk. I'm going to talk about testing ballot marking devices. This is joint work with an undergraduate student, Ron Shi, who visited Berkeley for the last year and uh, did some research with me. Um, why do we need to test ballot marking devices? Well, they can print votes that differ from what the voters saw on the screen or heard through the audio interface. Uh, the idea of voter verifiability is not really refined enough to capture the security properties that we need in a voting system. Um, in particular, the ability to uh, catch an error and spoil the ballot and request another opportunity to vote isn't enough to make ballot marking devices safe voting technology. Um, for example, recent research by Bernard et al. Uh, showed that uh, only 7% of voters notice errors that ballot marking devices have introduced into the printout. <clears throat> now, in effect, uh, the security properties of paper are undermined by using ballot marking devices to mark the paper. There's a problem with the BMB security model in general. It basically makes voters responsible not only for their own errors, but also for the overall security of the system. But they don't give voters the tools they need to do that job. In particular, there's no way for a voter to present any other party, including an election official, with evidence that a BMD misbehaved. Um, so if a voter complains to a local election official, there's no way for the election official to know whether the complaint reflects an actual malfunction, a voter error, or a cry of wolf trying to undermine the trust in the election. Um, as a result of that, error or malfeasance could change a lot of votes without raising any kind of alarm. So a number of proponents of BMDs claim that they have a number of that benefits such as preventing overvotes, warning about undervotes, and eliminating the possibility of ambiguous marks. I think that uh, there's problems with those arguments. In particular, they assume that ballot marking devices function correctly. And there are many recent examples of failures on a wide scale, including in the state of Georgia, Northampton, Pennsylvania, and in Los Angeles. Um, precinct count optical scan systems can also protect against overvotes and undervotes. In fact, that's required under VVSG 1.0. So how can we figure out whether ballot marking devices actually worked adequately in a given election? We need to know that whatever errors occurred didn't, uh, weren't numerous enough to change the outcome of any contest in the election. Three different approaches have been proposed to testing ballot marking devices. One is pre-election logic and accuracy testing, where you sit, look at a machine before election day, run some test patterns through it, and verify that it prints the right thing. Another approach is passive testing, where you look at something like the spoiled ballot rate and try to detect anomalously high rates of spoiled ballots as a possible signal that the machines are misbehaving and voters are catching it. And the third approach is parallel or live testing, where testers periodically throughout the day, on election day um, or during early voting period, will uh, mark some ballots but not cast them and verify that what's marked on the, on the printout matches what their intent was. And the point of uh, our research is to show that none of these, in fact, can work in practice. So how much testing do we really need to do? And that depends on how big a problem would make a material difference. And I have argued a long time that a sensible threshold for materiality is enough to change the reported winner of one or more contests. That is, we'd like to have high confidence that whatever errors occurred, they didn't alter who won. Many contests in the US are decided by less than 1%. Um, even statewide contests. For example, in 2016 presidential election, the margin in the statewide contests in Michigan, uh, Rhode Island, uh, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin were all under 1%, with Michigan being as low as 0.22%. So I'm going to frame this as a two-person adversarial game um, and think about what strategies are available to the two players. So the evildoer is Mallory, who's trying to alter the outcome of one or more contests in an election. Mallory doesn't want to be, be detected. The point of this isn't to cast fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's to get away with altering an election outcome. Uh, Mallory knows how the uh, ballot, ballot marking devices will be tested in general um, because that will be a matter of public record. That is an action taken by the local election official. And so so Mallory, knows, uh, Mallory knows the uh, state history of the machine. Um, Mallory uh, knows how voters are interacting with it and knows what votes have been cast earlier in the day, how long each voting session took, and so on. Um, and Mallory has a good model of voter behavior because Mallory can basically install spyware on voting machines and keep track of how voters interact with those machines in previous elections and on into the future. In contrast, Pat is our tester. Pat is trying to make sure that any ballot marking device problem that alters one or more outcomes will be detected. 
Um, in contrast to Mallory, Pat has to obey the law, has to protect voter privacy. Pat doesn't know which contest Mallory will attack, nor the strategy Mallory is going to use to attack them. So this is a very asymmetric problem. All right, so the, because the threshold for materiality depends on the number of votes that it takes to alter an election outcome, um, it's important to keep track of how big or how small elections are in the United States. The median turnout by uh, county in, uh, whoops, the, in 2017, not 3017, oh, sorry, in the 3017 U.S. counties that there are in 2018 was a little under 3,000 voters. There are uh, fewer than 43,000 voters in more than two-thirds of U.S. jurisdictions. And in 73% of states, um, more than 50% of counties have fewer than 30,000 active voters. That is, the median size of uh, uh, turnout in a county is 30,000 uh, voters or fewer. In 92% of states, um, that number is 100,000. That is, more than 50% of counties have fewer than 100,000 active voters. In 2019, only 317 U.S. cities had populations of 100,000 or more out of more than 19,000 incorporated places. So if uh, about 80% of the population is a voting age and turnout is about 55%, um, which is roughly what it's been historically, then contests for elected officials in something like 98% of incorporated places involve fewer than 44,000 voters. So we need to think about ways of testing things on contests that involve fewer than 44,000 voters, and many contests will involve even you know, fewer than 3,000 voters. The 2019 uh, median population of U.S. incorporated errors is about 725. So about 50% of incorporated places have a turnout of less than 320 voters. All right. Um, this is just give an idea how much of the country has um, a median turnout, uh, had a median turnout in 2018 of less than 30,000 voters. It's really most of the country by, by area. So what's Mallory's strategy space? How can Mallory figure out which transactions or, or what votes to try to alter? Um, Mallory basically can pick based on a very large number of state variables in the ballot marking device, the time of day, um, how long the wait was between voters, um, how many people have voted on the machine already, how does this particular voter interact with the machine, including the selections, what contests the voter ignores, how, long, how many times the voter revises selections, how long the voter reviews things, um, whether the voter looks at every page of the candidates in a contest, um, how long the voter reviews uh, selections, um, inactivity warnings, BMD settings, font sizes, languages, um, whether the voter uses the audio interface, the SIP and PUF interface, all of these things are available to a Maldu or to Mallory to try to hack the election. So here are some examples of just how many different possible voting transactions there are. Um, I'm giving two columns of numbers. The more realistic number is pretty realistic in the United States. Um, very, many states have, uh, or many jurisdictions have ballots that contain 20 or more contests, but we're going to use three as basically a lower bound. Um, and similarly, you can look at different variables that Mallory could use to target these things from the number of candidates per contest, languages, time of day, the number of people who voted, um, time for selection. Uh, the, the settings that the voter uses, the contrast and saturation of the screen, font size, audio use, tempo, volume, and so on. So conservatively, there's on the order of six million different combinations of settings um, that are likely to have some reasonable probability of being used. Um, more realistically, there's something over 10 to the 47th, a truly staggering number of possible voting transactions. There's no way to probe even a microscopic fraction of those using um, testing, either uh, pre-election logic accuracy or live testing. So what can Pat do? Um, that's what Mallory can do. Um, Pat can monitor voter behavior in a non-invasive, non-privacy invading way, in particular can look at spoiled ballot rates. And Pat can try to catch a malfunction um, by using the BMD before, during, or after an election, that is doing logic and accuracy testing or live testing or uh, post-mortem. So uh, Pat really does have to test at random in some way. If Pat tests, tests in a way that's predictable, such as once an hour, or pulls only one machine aside and tests it, um, or tests only some combinations of, uh, of votes, only interacts with a machine in some particular way, 
then because Mallory knows what test uh, Pat's strategy is, Mallory, Mallory can just avoid changing those transactions and, and, and hide. Um, similarly, Pat can't just set aside machines on election day for live testing. Pat needs to test the machines that are actually in use, or malware could detect that the machine is being used in a way that is not typical of voters. Um, so you, and moreover, because there are so many possible combinations of settings, combinations of you know, ways of transacting um, a vote, uniform random sampling is doomed. You really do need to sample um, more often from those transactions that voters are going to use more often in order to have a reasonable chance of sampling at least once from any set of transactions that contain enough votes to alter the outcome of one or more contests in the election. So ideal sampling would mimic voter behavior. It would basically sample from what voters actually do. <clears throat> so we're going to look, look at exactly that. I suppose we could mimic voters perfectly. How many uh, transactions would we actually need to use as tests in order to have a good chance of detecting outcome-changing um, errors or alterations? So it's important to know that in a jurisdiction-wide contest, changing the votes on 1% of transactions can typically change the margin by 2%, but if there's undervotes, it can change it by even more than that. And if the contest is only on a fraction of ballots cast in the election, then you don't need to change even that large of a percentage to change a margin by, by a much larger percentage. For instance, if you have a contest that's only on, uh, that only one in 10 voters is eligible to vote in, and the undervote rate is 30%, then changing the votes on 1% of transactions could change the margin in that contest by 29%. has a lot of leverage. So passive testing relies on voters uh, noticing errors and spoiling their ballots. Um, now, in order to know how large a spoilage rate is enough to sound an alarm, we have to have a good idea of how often uh, voters spoil ballots when the machines are functioning correctly. Um, and then we have to know how often they will notice errors if errors happen and um, what they will, uh, whether they will report those errors and, uh, and thereby you know, request a new ballot and trigger, and trigger an alarm. Problem is that kind of training data is unlikely to be available in part because you can't step on the same election twice. Um, there are all kinds of differences from election to election that are likely to change the spoiled ballot rate, including complexity of the ballot, ballot layout, um, complexity of the social choice functions, and so on. So how do we set a threshold for when to sound an alarm if we're using passive auditing, um, passive testing? Um, it's going to depend in part on the number of transactions Mallory alters, which votes are affected, which contests are affected, and so on. And Pat is not going to know any of these things. Pat needs to test in a way that is going to be sensitive enough to changing the, con the outcome of any contest whatsoever. So let's make some really optimistic assumptions and work through the numbers and figure out just how much testing Pat would have to do or how many voters would have to be voting in the particular contest so that a change in their spoiled ballot rate would be noticed. But let's assume in particular that they follow that the spoiled ballot rate follows a spoiled ballots follow a Poisson distribution with a known rate if there's no hacking and a different known rate if there is hacking. Now there's no reason to assume that except it's a common model for things. This is really just a thought experiment. It's not intended to be a realistic model of how voters detect uh, and, and um, uh, spoil ballots. We're going to look at contest margins of one to five percent and false positive and false negative rates of 5% and 1%. So a false positive rate is saying that there's a problem when there really isn't one. A false negative rate is failing to notice uh, that there's a problem when, in fact, one or more outcomes have been altered. Now, here's kind of how it plays out. This is for 5% rate of false negatives and false positives. Um, if you look at this, uh, the going across the top is the base rate of um, spoiled ballots when things are clean. And then as you go from row to row, you're really looking at what is the rate of um, uh, errors in the printouts that would be required to reverse a margin of size 1%, 2%, 3%, on to 5%. The detection rate we're assuming is either 7% or 25%. 7% is consistent with what Bernard et al. found in their study of uh, actual voters in, a, in an experiment that wasn't an actual election. Um, so if you look at this to have a 5% uh, false positive and uh, false negative rate, you'd need on the order of half a million ballots or more um, for a realistic rate of voters detecting uh, uh, errors and spoiling their ballots to protect against uh, altering a contest with a margin of 1%. Um, that number goes down as the margin gets wider, but as I've already argued, there are a very large number of contests that are decided by 1% or less important contests. 
if we uh, make a more stringent threshold of requiring uh, only a 1% rate of false negatives or false positives, then we would need on the order of a million voters or more in the contest in order to be able to detect an alteration to 1% to, to enough ballots to alter to reverse a margin of 1%. So let's think about how big this number, half a million or a million, is in the context of actual elections. And so let's, I'm going to use California as an example. Um, 41 of California's 58 counties had fewer than 100,000 voters in the 2018 midterm election, so passive uh, auditing would not have worked for any of those. 33 had fewer than 100,000 voters in the 2016 presidential election, so again, passive auditing would not have given you an acceptably low false positive and false negative rate, even under these optimistic assumptions that um, everything follows a Poisson distribution with a known rate. Um, so passive testing couldn't have protected contests with margins of 3% or smaller in uh, those jurisdictions that have 100,000 or fewer voters. Uh, in many California counties, turned out so small that um, there would be no way to detect problems through spoilage rates without having an unacceptably high rate of false alarms. We'd be um, inv invalidating elections left and right. <clears throat> okay. So that uh, analysis assumed that votes were being changed more or less at random, that every voter had some chance of having his or her uh, votes altered. Um, but in fact, Mallory has access to information to use to target the attack against voters who are less likely to notice problems or less likely to um, spoil a ballot if there is a problem. Um, in particular, um, Mallory could target uh, voters with visual impairments or voters who are blind. Um, that could, uh, if such voters, current ballot marking devices don't provide such voters a technology to check whether the printout actually matches the voter's intentions or what the voter was um, uh, told on the audio output or on the screen in, in, you know, in, a, in a larger font size. So if 2% of voters uh, have a visual impairment that would prevent them from checking the printout directly themselves, then Mallory could change the outcomes of jurisdiction-wide contests that have margins of 4% or more without increasing the spoiled ballot rate at all because those voters would have no opportunity to notice that there was a problem in the printout. Um, motor, uh, voters that have uh, some kind of motor impairments that um, make it difficult for them to, uh, uh, if they have limited dexterity that makes it difficult for them to handle a piece of paper, some ballot marking devices have an accessibility feature that allows a voter to um, cast the ballot uh, without actually handling it. In some cases, those features don't even print the ballot until the voter has said, I want you to cast this for me after you print it. So because uh, that doesn't even give the voter the opportunity to look at the piece of paper, um, the ballot marking device can cheat um, uh, with impunity on ballots like that. So if there are enough voters who are using this autocast feature, then relatively wide margins can be altered um, without uh, any possibility of a detection. Um, languages other than English, uh, voters, if a voter uh, is looking at a ballot on screen in one language but then printing it out uh, in English, um, the voter might be less likely to check the printout um, if, that's, if the voter is not so comfortable in English. Um, moreover, if a voter uh, who is a, you know, clearly a native foreign language speaker reports a problem with a ballot, um, it might be the case that some um, poll workers would be less likely to believe that the voter actually detected a problem with the device and rather more likely to believe that the voter made a mistake. <clears throat> um, there's all kinds of things that uh, Mallory can monitor to try to target the attack by looking at how much attention the voter is paying, whether the voter is in a hurry, whether the voter is reviewing selections, and so on. Um, all right. So... Um, there are other problems with passive testing. Among them, it becomes a really easy way to um, raise a FUD attack through uncertainty and doubt by simply asking voters to spoil their ballots more often, um, casting doubt on the election. All right, so let's look at these oracle bounds now. Um, suppose that instead of relying on voters to run the tests, uh, we have to, um, we're going to try something like um, parallel testing, active testing, or logic and accuracy testing where we input test patterns and look at what comes out. So um, if, if we had perfect knowledge of voter behavior, that is if basically Pat could pick voters at random and look over their shoulders while they vote and see whether the printout matched what the vote um, was presented on the screen or in the audio output, um, that's kind of a best case scenario. 
the, that doesn't involve ha having to figure out um, the distribution of voter transactions with, uh, with the, the, uh, the BMD. So even under those circumstances, um, um, it takes a fair number of votes in order to um, you have to spy on a fair number of voters, have to look over the shoulder of a fair number of voters to have a reasonable chance of uh, noticing a problem in the election. So, um, for instance, um, if Mallory alters 15 transactions in a contest that has a little under 3,000 voters, which was the 2018 median jurisdiction uh, turnout, um, that could change uh, the outcome of a contest by 1% by or more. But Pat would need to look over the shoulder of at least 540 voters, about 18% of the capacity of the machine. Um, that would involve testing each ballot marking device several times an hour. But once an hour would not be enough. Um, if you're limiting things to once an hour for 13 hours a day, then to have a 95% chance of uh, catching a problem, you have to have um, over 6,500 voters in the contest, which is almost triple the median turnout in jurisdictions in the U.S. and 20 times the median uh, number of active voters in incorporated areas. In reality, Pat can't shoulder surf. Pat needs to make a model of voter behavior, and that's got to be calibrated to data. Um, that's going to require monitoring voters in extreme detail, all of the details I mentioned before in relating to voting transactions. That would compromise voter privacy completely um, and probably be illegal. Nonetheless, um, let's imagine that Pat had a budget of running an infinite number of tests using a particular model. How many voters would Pat need to observe in order to get a model that was accurate enough to detect uh, an alteration to some fraction of the votes? So to have 99% confidence of detecting a change to a half percent of the votes, um, even if Pat could conduct an infinite number of tests, in order to model behavior well enough to detect things um, at that confidence level would involve monitoring um, three and three quarter million voters in excruciating detail. And of course their behavior in one election might not match their behavior in another election. And many jurisdictions that you need to be, where you'd be needing to be monitoring aren't big enough. They just simply don't have that many, that many voters. Um, as you look at larger margins and lower confidence levels, that bound goes down. But even from 95% confidence of detecting um, alterations to 5% of the votes, you'd have to have, you'd have to observe more than a million voters. And these are very, very conservative bounds. <clears throat> uh, if you had a test limit of 2,000 tests to conduct, then the number of um, voters you would need to observe, you need to have an even more accurate model. You would have to observe even more voters. So the message here is you really have to look at, monitor a million voters in excruciating detail, at least, um, in order to have a reasonable chance of picking up outcome changing errors. All right, so the uh, situation is really not very good. I mean, it's actually worse than this. Even if you were able to do that much testing, if you find a problem, the only remedy is a new election. You have no idea which transactions were altered, what the right outcome should be. Um, margins aren't known before when the testing happens. If it turns out that the margin is smaller than you allocated testing for um, while the election was going on, there's no way to go back and fix that. The tests themselves, oops, sorry, have uncertainty. Um, and that means that you really need to factor that in in deciding what, you know, who really won. Is there really strong enough evidence that someone really won if there's only a 95% chance you would have seen a problem that big? Um, moreover, this is going to require new systems, extra hardware, additional uh, uh, staff, and uh, additional training. So this is a very expensive proposition, even if it could possibly be mounted. So uh, our conclusion is that uh, also, uh, as I mentioned before, while BMDs are widely touted as helping some groups of voters, in fact, BMDs pose an ideal vector for disenfranchising those very same groups of voters because they will interact with the machines in specific ways. <clears throat> uh, in short, there doesn't really seem to be a way to rescue the trustworthiness of elections if you're casting most of the votes on ballot marking devices or a substantial fraction of votes on ballot marking devices. And prudent election administration would involve minimizing the number of voters who use ballot marking devices, really reserving them um, for their accessibility benefits, where those accessibility benefits really do help particular groups of voters. Thank you very much for your attention.